Enthroned in the Father's love Destined to die Poured out for all mankind Holy Son, Holy Son Perfect and spotless one He never sinned But suffered as if he did all authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory is yours. Savior, worthy of honor and glory. Worthy of all of our praise, for you overcame. Jesus, awesome and power forever, awesome and great is your name, you overcame. Power in Speaking the Father's plan You're sending us out Right in this broken land All authority Every victory Is yours All authority Every victory is yours. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of our praise, you overcame. Jesus, awesome and powerful Awesome and great is your name, you overcame. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, everyone overcome. Say, power forever, awesome and great is your name, for you overcame. One more. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of our praise, you overcame. Awesome and power forever, awesome and great is your name, for you overcame. Sorry, Sheila. It's, it's four of them. Four of them. I only told Rick two of them, so I had it way wrong. <laughs> I knew I'd screw it up eventually, don't worry. <laughs> Where are you going? Sheila's oh, skipping. Know. She's skipping no, our. I'm just all messed up. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, Sheila, we got two hymns in there I somewhere, don't we? Story. Yeah, somewhere. Okay, I got it. I'm with you now. That music just didn't line up. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's what I was thinking, but I thought, well, I've already screwed up once. It may I'll be me. You're, and now. you're gonna, your battery's about to die too. Look at you. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we're all a mess. <laughs> I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice, O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of to every Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done, great things He hath 
thought of great things he has done, and great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son, and pure and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Or does it move? <laughs> mm, I can't find my spot. <laughs> He became sin, 
Bibles this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> we talked uh, last week in Titus chapter 2, if I remember right, I've slept since then. And uh, we talked about verse 11, um, which if you weren't here last week, I'll share something with you in just a second. But um, Titus 2 and 11 said this, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. We've talked, I don't know, probably two years now about witnessing. We've talked about evangelism. We've talked about sharing the gospel with people. Um, and that verse is one that is not a, obviously a new verse to many of us. Uh, many of us, of us have heard Titus chapter 2 verse 11 before. But when me and Emily were coming up with these cards, and again we talked about these last week, and if you didn't get some, let me know, we'll get some. Um, but basically, it was just an easy way to, to tell people about what church you go to and start a conversation, right? All it says on here is the name of our church, our address, um, our email account, and then our service times. And then it says, we welcome you to join us, and it has Titus 2, 11 at the bottom. And again, it's just something simple to, to put out there for people. But in Titus 2 and 11, when he says salvation is for all people, it's for all, for everyone, right? Um, I, I think the saying is, we've said it before, you see all in the Bible, that's all it means. 
no matter what, right? Every time. It's always all. If it says all, it means it. So when we talk about sharing the gospel, the gospel is not limited to the people that we think deserve it. It is not limited to the people that are without sin, because if it was, none of us would have rights to salvation. Um, I'm not going to get any, too many amens on that, but the reality is we're all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all broken. No matter if you're uh, living in this sin or that sin, sin is sin. And I don't know how many people I've tried to have that conversation with in my own life that, well, it's, an old, it's a sin in the Old Testament. Yup. And? The Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament. Yup. And? Jesus did not come to negate the, the laws, the rules that God had ordained in the Old Testament. Nothing in the Old Testament is gone other than sacrificing animals because Jesus sacrificed himself for our sins and our shortcomings. So when we look at sharing the gospel with people, and, and maybe this isn't you, maybe you don't have this problem, but there are people in Christian walks today that have trouble sharing the gospel with people that are living in a life that they think is sinful. Well, you're never going to share the gospel with anybody if you really look at everybody's lives, amen? Everybody is sinful. We live in a broken world, and even if you became a Christian because you didn't want hell and because you wanted to be a better person, right? Because Jesus said the only way to heaven is through him, right? And the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If we really believe all that is true, we had to realize at one point that we needed him. Amen? And we realized that when somebody preached to us or somebody told us about our sins. I've said it several times. I got saved when I was eight. I truly probably didn't really understand what sin was as far as in my own life. And I remember being a young Christian, and I'm talking eight, nine, ten years old, praying, God, forgive me for the sins that I committed today that I don't even understand, right? And church, I still have to pray that prayer some days today because there are things that are said that maybe you said wrong. There are things that are done that maybe you didn't mean it that way, but it happened, right? Um, it, it doesn't take much to those things to happen in your life. But in, in Timothy chapter 2, Paul writing to Timothy, and, and we're going to be looking at the first 13 verses. So if you would stand in honor of reading God's word, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1. And Paul writes this, You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me in the presence of my many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please his commanding officer. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be first to get a share of the crops. Consider what I am saying, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they may obtain salvation, which is Christ, in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faith, faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself let's pray this morning heavenly father god as we come to you this morning we thank you for this time of worship we've had this morning to sing praises to your name god that you are a good good father uh, god that you are willing to give us a victory and i just thank you for that god i ask this morning that you be with this message god let everything said and done be glorifying to you allow our hearts to be responsive this morning god to hear what you're saying to us god that we would respond in a way that would glorify your name and you alone god it's not about us it's all about you, and God, I just ask that you would help us each and every day. Forgive us where we fail you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and amen. So he starts off there, you therefore my son. If you know much about Paul, Paul doesn't have any physical children that we know of, right? None that I've ever seen. So he's not literally the father of Timothy, but when you look at Timothy's life, Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. T Timothy was the person that was behind Paul, that Paul was bringing along beside of him to lead the church when it was time for Paul to pass on the baton. Jesus did the same thing with the 12 disciples, right? 11 in the end because Judas denied Christ, killed himself, all the things that he did, right? But, but he tried to do that with the 11 
So Paul, being a disciple, okay, and disciple is, is, there's meaning to that. There are people today that say they're a disciple of Jesus. No, they're not. A disciple is somebody that truly had a one-on-one encounter with Jesus. They met face-to-face with Jesus. So, so if, if I was to get up here and say, well, I'm a disciple of Jesus, that would be hard to believe because Jesus has only taught me through his words, not from physically me knowing him and hearing it, right? It's been passed down how many times at this point? From Jesus' time, almost 2,000 years since Jesus died on a cross for our sins. So I would not be able to say that I'm a disciple of Jesus. But, but Paul truly was a disciple of Jesus because of his encounter on the Damascus Road, because we see that Jesus spoke to him audibly, right? Very few times do we see in Scripture that Jesus speaks audibly to somebody other than when he walked this earth and was face to face, right? So, so when he, wa- he s- did those things on the Damascus Road, Paul was therefore committed to Jesus. He's a follower of Jesus directly now. And he's trying to do the same thing with Timothy and others along the way, Titus uh, and, and others. Paul, Paul was not a, a one-trick pony, if you would think of it that way, right? Paul was educated. If you really look at the disciples, Paul was probably the most educated one of all of them. He, he was on his way to be a, a Pharisee, if you remember Scripture in the book of Acts. So he's talking to, to, to Timothy, and he says that, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So... We've been given grace, and I want to ask you something this morning. How often do we give grace? It's been given to us, right? How often do we give grace to other people? I think so often of the, uh, the debtor in the, in, in the New Testament, and Jesus is talking, and he, he got forgiven this large amount of money, right, by his master, by, by he, who he was serving. But then he went, as soon as he got his money, and he went and strangled the next guy to give him the money that he owed him, Right? And I don't know if you remember the story, it didn't end well for him <laughs> because he was a poor servant. See, Jesus has forgiven a great sin in our lives, but we're not willing to overlook small things that happen sometimes, right? There, there's anger that's uh, and animosity against other people, and so often because we're not strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ, because we're weak sometimes, maybe more often than not, we miss the mark because we're too busy w- looking at the mistake somebody else has made. In church, we've all done it. If we really be honest with ourselves, we've all done it. Annabelle's even done it at three, right? We've all held a grudge. We've all said things. We've all done things that maybe hurt somebody else more than we ever realized. But he says, he says what you have heard from me in verse 2, in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And Tony Evans put it this way, Timothy couldn't bear the ministry burden alone. He needed to pass the spiritual baton to faithful men and women who could transfer God's truth to others. If we look at, I'm, I'm going to use VBS because it's coming up, right? And I'm going to pick on Mike and Sheila. Mike does not like teaching the little kids. Right, Mike? I'm not saying anything that's not true, right? Sheila is, is okay with both, but she likes the little kids a little better, if I remember right, right? So if I was to ask Mike to teach the little kids, and I was asked ask Sheila to teach the adult class, right? They're going to look at me like I'm crazy, Right? That's not in my wheelhouse. That's not what I've got. We all teach to a different level of people. Emily deals with two, three, four-year-olds all the time, right? I can't teach two, three, and four-year-olds. I'd pull my hair out, okay? I'd run out screaming the, front, the first day on the job, okay? It's not for me, right? Sometimes youth ministry is not for, for me either, but we all go through phases, right, where we can teach certain groups. I think Mike said that his group just keeps going along with him, right, Mike? You started teaching the young adults, and now you're According to the book, it's senior adults, right? So I don't know what that's saying about you that are in the room in Sunday school. I don't think all of you are senior adults, so just throw that out there. But that's the class Mike's teaching, okay? But we, the reality is that if, if we all try to do ministry alone, right, we're only going to be reaching so many people, the people that we are able to communicate with, right? I've been in Evansville, and Evansville's a big enough city that there are people there that have no idea what farming is, Okay? Literally, like, where do you get your, your stuff? Well, Walmart. Okay, what if Walmart doesn't have it? I don't know. Walmart. Okay, well, that's not where it comes from, but okay, got it. So, and they would laugh when I would talk about drive your tractor to school day. Granted, I never drove my tractor to school, okay? We didn't have a tractor that would go fast enough. It, I would have to leave, like, the day before, okay, to make it. Uh, but the reality is, in, this, in town, right, if I was to talk about farming, people are going to look at me like, why is this crazy guy talking about farming? I know nothing about that, right? 
But if I was to come out here and talk about, I don't even know, I'm not good at this, uh, opposite end of the spectrum there, okay, that's why I'm in the country, uh, but what, Emily, you're, soccer, yeah, sure, he can know soccer, right, but who of us watches soccer on TV? I don't, right, I don't hardly watch sports at all, right, but it, it, the, the same is true with anything, right, if I was trying to teach football and all I played was baseball, it's not going to end well, is it? We're not going to be a very good football team. Nobody, nobody's got anything on that. Okay, no, no. The answer is no, you won't be. But he says, he says commit to faithful men or women who, who will be able to teach others. So don't just pick people that you just you like, right? He said pick people who are able to teach the next generation. Church, without Paul's declaration to Timothy to do that, and Timothy continuing to do that in his ministry, I don't know where we would be today. It's people like Timothy and people like Barnabas and the people that you don't see in the Bible a ton, right, that shared the gospel in a way that we received it today. It says, share in suffering is a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So he gives three illustrations here between verses 3 and 6. And he says in verse 4, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to, to please the commanding officer. So the first one there is the good soldier. He presents the Christian life as a warfare against Satan in hostile, in a hostile world. <laughs> right? Church, we are in battle with Satan today. God's already won the big war, right? But the battle continues each and every day in our own lives and the lives of those around us. There is a spiritual battle going on in everyone's life if they want to really be honest, right? E even the atheist is dealing with a spiritual battle in their lives. And Christian, it's up to us to be willing to serve as a good soldier. To be worried about what our commanding officer tells us to be worried about. And Jesus, right? It says that he doesn't get entangled in civilian life. And, to, and, and Tony Evans said this, To be victorious in battle, no soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but seeks to please his or her commanding officer. Military service places restrictions on personal liberty, so does Christian ministry. So when you become a soldier, you serve the country that you're a soldier for, right? Or you should be. I mean, there's some betrayers out there. Christian, our job is to serve the master that has called us into salvation, into church, into whatever we want to call it. But we as Christians have all, all been called to be on the battlefield for Jesus. Not just a few of us, not just the pastors in the world, but everybody that is in a church this morning has been called to be a witness for Jesus. He continues in the next one. He says, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So the second one is that. The illustration involves an athlete. All of his or her efforts are wasted unless they follow the rules. And that is, he says, Tony Evans says this, operates within biblical guidelines and does not yield to worldly pleasures. So if we are playing a game, right, and we don't follow the rules and we win, did we really win? No, we would call that cheating, right? Or I would call it cheating, maybe, especially if I was the loser, I'm going to complain about it, right? Maybe a ref was bad in a game, or an umpire, and we've all been there, done that, okay? Just going to throw this out there, don't yell at them. It doesn't get any better if you yell at them. We found that out a few times over the years. I'm not saying who yelled at him. It might have been me. It might have been some other people I know. <laughs> but, but it says that he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The rule is, is we've been given the rules. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that's it right here. The rules are right here. But we as Christians struggle to follow a book that we've had for how many years in our house? I've got more than one in my house. I don't know about everybody else. I've probably got five or six in my office let alone what I got at home. Church, we, we've been given the rules. We've been given the guidelines, but we still struggle. And I don't want anybody to think Trevor's beating on us. No, Trevor struggles too. I've only read through the Bible. I've been a Christian 20 years. I think I've only read through the Bible three times in my life. You think I remember everything? No, I get up here and I prove that I do not remember everything, okay? I can't even find the verse half the time. I know I highlighted it somewhere. That's how I remember the verse. It's highlighted in my Bible. I'll skim through it until I find it sometimes. But we're all been, we all have to do these things according to the rules. And he gives us the last one. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. 
And I'm reading out of Tony Evans this morning because his notes were really good. He said he compares it to a farmer and says farmers must look, work long hours in all conditions. Laziness will f- fail to produce a harvest. I think we've all seen that before, right? If you, if you have a garden at home and you don't care any about it and it gets weeds in it, how good is your crop going to be? Probably not very, right? Sometimes a storm comes and knocks the crops over. Mom and dad uh, have some sweet corn that got a little twisted the other day because, you know, we had some wind, apparently. And, and, and we look at those things and, and he says that they ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. So basically he's saying if you work hard, you're going to receive the blessings, the gifts in eternity. Church, we've not been called to take it easy. Be, being a Christian isn't just sitting in a pew. And I don't know how many pastors I've heard that from in the last month. When I listen to, to different sermons, we, we as uh, Christians today, can I be really honest? Not just Ellis Mound, it's everywhere, okay? We're comfortable just showing up. We are. And I learned a long time ago comfort is not a good place to be as a Christian. We have to be uncomfortable, church. We've got to get out of the seat and be willing to just share a card with somebody that says, hey, I invite you to church this week. Who, who was here last week and got cards and shared them? Did everybody share their cards last week? I got some on my wallet. I just pulled one out, so I didn't do very good on my end. We probably struggled this week. If, I, if we're being honest with ourselves, I was around a lot of people this week. But I think I still got four in my pocket. Three. That one counts in my pocket, okay? So I gave one. I started with five. I gave one this week. I'm going to admit that I failed this week. I don't deserve to take share of the crops because I didn't do work very hard this week. He says in verse 7, Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Church, we, we try to understand everything like we are experts. I, I don't care if you've been a Christian 50 years, you're not an expert. I, I, I really I believe that there is no such thing as truly an expert on the Bible because nobody can read it enough to understand every ounce of it, Right? There are seminary teachers that know it well. They can read, they, they can quote scripture. But just because you quote it doesn't mean you know it. Does it mean you're living it? Does it mean you're believing it? But he says that God, the Lord, will give you understanding in everything. You may not understand what I'm telling you right now, but God's going to give it to you if you seek him out, if you seek his face. When I was preparing this week, I was almost in the Old Testament in an old book called uh, Habakkuk, and I can't say Habakkuk right, so if you wrong should correct me later i really don't care but it, it, if you don't know where it's at it's in the old testament towards the end of it okay and and he was a minor prophet and i, I call him whiny sometimes because he prays and god answers every i mean if you read it chapter one he starts a prayer and god answers chapter two he starts another prayer and god answers and i was going to go there and, and tell, re, reminding us that god does answer us but we've got to seek him first we, we've got to seek his face over and over again and when I was working through my notes this week, this is what I put at the top. It will not be easy. Church, being a Christian is not easy. It's not just check the box and go on with your day. If we're truly a Christian, we're going to believe that these words that are on this page are not just words on a page. Verse 8, he says, Remember Christ Jesus risen from the dead and descended from David according to my gospel, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Paul tells us where he's at. He's in prison. He's bound up. Paul deserved to be in prison long before this when he was Saul, right? And he was murdering people. But he says, I'm bound like a criminal, but the word of God is not. Every single one of us in this room could end up in prison because of uh, the gospel of Jesus. And guess what? It's not going to stop. If you're not sharing the gospel and invite people to your church, there's somebody else sharing the gospel, inviting them to their church. The gospel will not stop. The Bible just says it, right? It also tells us that it won't return void. <laughs> the word of God is not bound. It's not bound by our standards. It's not bound by anything. But our inability to share it with the next person. God's called each of us to share it. He's called each of us to, to know somewhat some verses that we can share with somebody. I encourage everybody to go look up the Roman road when they leave this morning. If there's an easier way to share the gospel, I want to know about it. But the Roman road's pretty easy. We've all sinned. We're all sinners. We all need a Savior. He says in verse 10, this is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they 
may also attain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So he says, I do these things, I endure these things, I continue to do these things so that they may obtain salvation. That those around me, those that will see these words, those that will hear the message, will admit that they're a sinner in need of a Savior and find salvation in Jesus and Jesus alone. And he says that they might find it which is in Jesus with eternal glory. So, so he's telling us right there again what Jesus told us time and time again. You'll be with me in eternity, right? What did he, he tell the, the criminal on the cross? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Eternity. He, he, he says that they may obtain salvation that is through Jesus and through Jesus only and they'll receive a spot in heaven I believe without a shadow of a doubt when when you get saved in your in your life and those of those around you God starts building your house in heaven I believe that I I believe he he, he's got the mailbox marked so to speak with your name on it and then he he quotes some scripture he quotes Galatians chapter 2 if I remember correctly in my study in this week in verses 11 12 and 13 it says for we died if we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And I'm going to read some quotes here, so give me just a second. <clears throat> Tony Evans puts it best. <laughs> the series of four comp- Couplets were perhaps a common saying among first century Christians. And he says, if we died with him, we'll also live with him, refers to our union with Christ. Through trusting him as our Savior, we have died with Christ. We've also raised with him. We have baptisms. Every one I've ever been in. (laughs) Buried with him to death, rise to walk in the newness of life. When that person goes under the water, it is symbolic of dying to the world, Dying with Christ, right? And coming up with Jesus and Jesus alone around you. And he says, if we endure, we also reign with him. Means that uh, if we live a consistent Christian life, we'll be rewarded with reigning with Christ when his kingdom comes. Church, there is blessings out of what we do today. You may not feel it today. You may not feel that this world is great. It's not. You shouldn't. But eternity is worth the fight. It's worth the things that we have to do. And then he says one that gives me this the worst feeling, I guess. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If our Christian lives are more covert than public, if we seek to please ourselves more than to please our God, we will lose the opportunity to partake in his reign with him. And he continues though, so don't take me to, to say just that. This does not involve loss of salvation, but loss of rewards and privileges. Doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation. I don't want anybody ever take that out of context and say, well, that's what that means, and that's what it means only. No. Calvinism is not the way the church should be going, and it's the way the Southern Baptist Convention is going right now, that you can lose your salvation. Church, you can't. I don't care how far you drift from God. If you truly accepted Jesus Christ as your life, as your Savior of your life, He will not leave you out of eternity with him he may not give you the rewards it's what the, that's what paul's referring to he's not saying that you won't have opportunity to be with him but he's saying that if you have have ex, have truly accepted him and you're not doing what the bible says you're to do there's not a reward for you you made it through the gate that's your reward but you get eternity to think about the rewards you have and the one you could have had so to speak won't be thinking about the bad. You'll be thinking about serving Jesus every day then. And then he says this. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And Tony Evans says this way. When our faith grows weak or even fails, God remains true to his promise to save us through Christ. To fail to keep his promise would for be him to deny himself and that he cannot do. Jesus promised us. He's not going to take that promise back. He's not an Indian giver. He's not dangling a carrot in front of you and just saying, well, if you just do this, you'll have a a place in eternity. If you just do this, you'll have a place in eternity. And he keeps moving the mark. No, the mark's the same. To get to eternity, all you have to do is believe that Jesus died on a cross for your sins. Accept him as your savior. That's it. That's it. That's the way to heaven. 
But when you get rewards in heaven, it's not just based on you getting saved, right? Everyone has the opportunity to get saved. But not everybody will get the same reward in eternity. I, I believe people like Billy Graham got a different reward than some of us are going to get. How many people did Billy Graham lead to Christ? His reward was based on how many people he led to Jesus, right? D.L. Moody, another a pastor that pastors still look to today, and D.L. Moody's been gone forever, right? That people still look to. How many people, how, how, what do you think his reward looked like in, in eternity? I think of people like David Jeremiah that are still here today. What's David Jeremiah going to look like when he gets there? Tony Evans. All these people that are, we, we, we look up to, we got Bibles with their names on them, right? How'd they get where they were? They shared the gospel. And God put them where they are today. Yeah, they went to seminary school. Yeah, they got educated. They did those things. But God put them on that path. If, you, if you've ever learned about Tony Evans, Tony Evans grew up in Baltimore. And Baltimore is not a, a, a happy place. I don't know if you've been to Baltimore or heard much about it. I think it's kind of uh, got some crime there maybe once in a while. But he started preaching when he was a young married man. <laughs> and they didn't have no money. And he was trying to go to school and do all these things, right? If you look at Billy Graham, you look at any of these, they didn't come for money. God blessed them with the things they had on this earth. And I can only imagine how he blessed them when they got to an eternity with him. Church, our goal, Emily said it a few weeks ago, our goal was to get more people to Christ than what I. Your goal should be to get more people saved than the preacher. <laughs> Why? Because the preacher preaches on Sunday mornings, right? I talk to people too, I'm not saying that. But I should be saving people, right? That should be my job. I should be getting people to Christ. I can't save them, but God can. But I should be leading people to do that. Church, you should be doing it. You should be sharing the gospel daily. I, I don't care if you share the gospel in your own house with people that are Christians. Christian today, you need to be strengthened by other Christians. That's what Timothy had because of Paul. You think Timothy would have been a good Christian without Paul? I don't. I don't think he'd have been a leader that he was without Paul. I, I don't think Titus would have been the leader that he was without Paul. I don't think Peter would have been the leader he was without Jesus. Church, it all comes back to somebody had to lead them to do those things. Jesus was following the commands of God the Father. Right? Jesus was there in the beginning, but God ordained everything. God put it in motion. God told Jesus he was going to go and die on a cross for the sins of the world. He did that. Jesus told us in the Bible that there's only one person that knows when the hour is coming. And it's God the Father. Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming back. Think about that. Jesus is God incarnate. He's the right hand of the Father. And God has kept that information for himself and himself only. Why? Why? Because if Jesus gave us the day and the hour, you'd share the gospel a little different, wouldn't you? If Jesus told us that Friday was going to be the last day on earth and the world was going to end at this time, you know what you'd spend your week doing? I guarantee you wouldn't go to work unless you were going to share the gospel there. No, you're going to find the people that you love and you care for and you're going to share the gospel with them. I know why Jesus gives, didn't give us the time in the Bible. Because he wanted us to never know when he was coming, right? Me, me and Emily lived in Evansville. We were kind of spoiled at this, right? And our parents would let us know, hey, we're coming over. Guess what we had time for? Clean the house, right? Straighten a few things up. Now we live five minutes away. They say they're coming. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> There's stuff everywhere. There's no way to clean it all up, right? We're not prepared for daily visits at our own house, let alone if God visits us, right? If, if one of you were to come to my house later, I probably would let you at the door. I'll just be honest. It's, it's a mess, right? I've got two little kids that sometimes we leave in a hurry and don't get everything cleaned up. Joanne reminded me earlier, we're about to have a lot of fun at our house. So Daniel's into everything. And when I say everything, I mean it. Church, we, we should prepare our lives for when Jesus comes back. If, you, if you're hosting Thanksgiving or Christmas at your house, you prepare your house, right? Right, Sheila? Your food, <laughs> everything, right? Make sure you got the right number of chairs. Make sure you got all these things. And no, never fails, you're still worried you're forgetting something, right? You go on vacation, you pack and you pack and you do all these things for a, a time ahead of it, right? You plan the whole trip. And then you get there and it's over like that. Church, church we, we prepare for things on earth like, like, oh my gosh, it's the last time I'm going to get to go to Florida, right? But we don't prepare ourselves 
for Jesus to come back. Where's Jesus going to find us? If he finds us in church, great. Rick's getting to go first, though, so I'm a little upset about it, okay? I get to go next, though, because I'm on this pulpit. And I get to stand a little taller. But if Jesus came back today, where would he find us? Would we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, or we had, well, you made it? <laughs> those, don't, those aren't the same thing to me, okay? To hear, well done, or, well, you made it. <laughs> they both had the word well in it, but it doesn't go the same way. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I believe that you want to hear that as well if you're a Christian this morning. If you don't, there's something wrong with you, okay? We need to talk. But we should want to hear, well done. I sure don't want to hear, be gone from me, for I never knew you. I don't want to hear that one. And I thank God today that 20 years ago I made that decision and I don't have to worry about that one, right? Church today, have you made that decision for Jesus? Have you made it that he's the king of your life? He's the Lord of your life, the savior of your world? Or are you just going through the motions? I'll throw this out there. lady that I grew up going to church with, okay? She led classes. She did all these things, right? And several years ago, she decided that she really didn't accept Christ when she thought she did. God got a hold of her and showed her that what she thought she knew, what she thought she'd accepted years and years ago was because some friend of hers had, and she went with her, right? Church, the church is full of people that thought they were a Christian. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, if you think you're a Christian and you're not, God's going to get a hold of you at some point. Because you're still living, a, you're, you're going to church every week, you're reading your Bible. You, you can read this Bible forward and backward and never get saved, amen? You, you can know it and never get saved. I, I know people that have got baptized and then claim later that like, they don't really believe they got saved. We had a kid do that, uh, one of our youth in Evansville do that. We got back and they questioned me and Emily, like, are you sure? They, we just baptized her before you guys came here. Well, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Church, when God gets a hold of us, he gets a hold of us the right way, right? Church, I believe that we will make or break our own lives, our own churches, our own everything, based on how we serve Jesus. And if we're not serving Jesus well, our church is going to feel it. There are churches today that at one point were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are struggling today because they quit sharing the gospel because they got big. Our church in Evansville, I talk about it a lot. They had 900 people that were members of that church. 700 were on the inactive role. To put it in perspective for us, there was three times on the inactive what was on the active role church today the role doesn't mean you're an active person for christ i don't want you to think i'm meaning that but if you're not in church every week somewhere and you're not reading this you're not an active role in christ's wheel you're not doing what god's called you to do as a christian i'm asking you to stand carrie and sheila to come <laughs> hey she says <laughs> sorry sheila put you on the spot and my daughter wasn't ready for it. <laughs> what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Church, you've heard salvation how many times in your life? <laughs> Maybe you're tired of hearing about it every Sunday. But if there's a Sunday that salvation is not preached at a church, I struggle to... I wonder about that church, I'll just be honest. Salvation is the only reason we gather. It's the only thing we have. For some of us, it might be the only thing we have in common, is that we serve Jesus, right? There, there are pastors that I know, that I care for, that we don't have anything in common except for Jesus. And I'm okay with that. When I was in high school, if you, we didn't play baseball or something, you didn't hang out with that person, right? If you didn't golf, you didn't play, you didn't play golf with that person, you didn't, you didn't hang out with that person. But when we put it in the perspective of I'm going to hang out with Jesus' people, that covers a lot of people, right? And, and I'll just be honest, that there's different, even the people in this room, I'd do different things with each of you if I was to hang out with you, right? For Bert, we go play golf, right? That's how me and Bert would hang out, right? For everybody else, it might be different. For Carrie, we're going to, we might build something, right, Carrie? <laughs> I don't know if that's a shot at me or he's just tired of building. I don't really know, but could go either way but 
for each of us, it's a different thing. We all have a different bond to each other. And we have to use those things as Christians today to strengthen each other, to grow together, to be faithful to Jesus. That's your call as Christians, is to be faithful to Jesus. I don't want you to be faithful to Trevor. I don't want you to be faithful to Ellis. I want you to be faithful to Jesus. And everything else is going to work out fine. But we all have to start being faithful to Jesus. And it doesn't mean just in the parts we like. It doesn't mean with the people we like. The Bible says with everybody, do it. <laughs> Bow your heads with me this morning. Heavenly Father, God, as we just come to you this morning, I thank you for who you are, God. I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your love. God, I thank you for sending people like Paul and and Timothy, God, to share the gospel and charging us the same charge that you've charged them. Go, therefore, and make disciples, God. God, I ask this morning that we would be faithful in making disciples for you, not for Ellis Mound Baptist Church, God, but for God's kingdom and your kingdom alone. God, your kingdom is above anything else. And God, I ask that we would be mindful, God, that your kingdom is coming. And God, that our days are limited to share the gospel with others. God, give us the burden. Give us the, the burden, God, that today could be the last day we'd see that person to share the gospel with them. God, that today would be the last day that you're going to knock on their door. God, give us the burden that you are coming back quickly. And God, that we need to share with everyone that we care for and those that we don't, God. That everyone would know, I don't want to be around that person because he just talks about Jesus. God, help us to be those people that we just talk about you. We talk about your love for us, God, and the love for the world that you have. God, I ask in this time of invitation that your will would just be done in our hearts. God, maybe it's salvation, God. Maybe it's baptism, church membership. God, you know every need. And God, I ask that we would just be faithful to you today. We'd be obedient to you, God. And all that's said and done would just be glory to, to your name and your name only. God, again, I ask these things, and, and I ask that you forgive us when we fail you. In the name of Jesus, I pray, and amen.